The good news here is that I can tell you what the Many Worlds interpretation says without starting a new slide. So Everett says you should have stopped after you had written down the two sensible rules of quantum mechanics. Welcome everyone to the Cartesian Cafe. Today, we're very lucky to have Sean Carroll here with us. Sean is a theoretical physicist and philosopher who specializes in quantum mechanics, cosmology, and the philosophy of science. He is the Homewood Professor of Natural Philosophy at John Hopkins University and an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute. Sean has contributed prolifically to the public understanding of science through a variety of mediums. As an author of several physics books, including Something Deeply Hidden and The Biggest Ideas in the Universe, as a public speaker and debater on a wide variety of scientific and philosophical subjects, and also as a host of his podcast, Mindscape, which covers topics spanning science, society, philosophy, culture, and the arts. Welcome, Sean. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me, Tim. It's such an honor to have you here, Sean. Um, I'm a big fan of your podcast, and you've also been a very big inspiration uh, to my own podcast. Uh, over the pandemic, uh, you put out your YouTube series, The Biggest Ideas in the Universe, which was a uh, pr precursor to your book series by the same name, where you uh, whiteboard uh, big physics ideas uh, on your iPad. And I reached out to you on uh, your Patreon, uh, asking you about your setup, and you referred me to your blog post, which went into the details. And I used that as uh, the template for my own solo videos, and now this podcast. So it's very oh, fitting great. for you <laughs> to, for you to be here, where we'll both be virtual whiteboarding now. Poisoning young minds is what I do best, so I'm very <laughs> proud of that. <laughs> um, great. Um, I wanted to first of all get to know a little bit more about your uh, professional trajectory. Now, most uh, scientists or science communicators uh, fall into two categories: either uh, they're a tenured academic or they fall well outside of academia. Now, you spent most of your career at Caltech, and I only learned recently that that was not a tenured position. Correct? Your title was that of a research professor, and therefore not a tenured associate or full professor. But from what I could observe, you basically function in all capabilities as a research uh, academic. Did not having tenure uh, have any effect on your research or your outreach activities? It didn't have quite that much impact on those activities. I mean, you have to go back one step before that. I was a junior faculty at the University of Chicago for seven years in a very standard kind of thing, uh, ten tenure track um, physics professor, et cetera. I had broad interests. I wrote the textbook, Space, Time, and Geometry, while I was still at the University of Chicago. And then I was not given tenure at the University of Chicago, which was a surprise to me and to most other people, but it happens sometimes. And I needed a decision to make because it was clear that a large part of that decision was because they were worried that since I had already written a textbook, I wasn't sufficiently devoted to doing research. There were other things I was interested in doing, which can be the kiss of death when it comes to getting tenure. So I could either have just doubled down on doing research and, and done everything I can to get a tenured job somewhere and be a regular professor, or I could lean into the fact that I like to do lots of different things and, and see you know, toss the dice and see how well I can do at that at that latter thing. And look, by by some point in your life, you got to do what you like doing. You know, you can't really, you know, uh, try too hard to sacrifice to the whims of others. When you're 20, you got to sacrifice to the whims of others a little bit. But when you're in your mid 30s, maybe less so. So I, I went to Caltech, which was I was offered. Um, I had opportunities to get tenured regular faculty jobs elsewhere. But Caltech was the best place that was interested in me and the job that they offered was this research professorship, which is good and bad. It's good because you don't have to do anything. You can just do research. That's all you have to do. You don't have to teach. You don't have to be on committees, a, a couple of committees, but not too many. The bad part is that you're not very flexible. You know, the good part of getting tenure is that you can do what you want intellectually. So at Caltech, I could do what I wanted with my time. But if I started doing too much stuff that was not what I was hired to do, they would lose the slot for me. You know what I mean? Um, I was there to do theoretical cosmology and particle physics and gravity. 
And I started drifting away from doing those things because I had other interests I thought were more exciting in philosophy and complexity and things like that. I still do the cosmology and gravity stuff, but it's it's a smaller part of my research. So I started looking around. They didn't they they were happy to have me around, but I started looking for a job that was a better fit for me, and I ultimately ended up at Johns Hopkins. Well, I'm glad that worked out. Um, I think most people, if they don't get a tenured position, they're done with their research career, right? So you, uh, it's very great that you were able to land that opportunity for so many years. Yeah, no, I mean, it was very, uh, I, I will always be grateful to Caltech and to the people there um, for hiring me. In fact, the person probably most responsible for hiring me at Caltech was Mark Kamienkowski, who is now my colleague at Johns Hopkins. So it all works out. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, I'm glad, glad to hear that. Maybe just one last question before we get to our uh, main discussion about many worlds. Um, uh, so you're one of the rare people that uh, does both science and philosophy, and it's it's hard to find people that do both. Um, I guess there's, uh, well, there's, there's reasons for that. One, science and philosophy are quite different subject matters in terms of content and style. Uh, you know, Bertrand Russell put it simply that science is what we know, philosophy is what we don't know. Uh, but there's also a pragmatic issue, which is that in academia, you're forced to be either a particular kind of scientist, say a physicist, or a particular kind of philosopher, say a philosopher of science. Uh, you've managed to do both. Um, do you have any opinions about whether uh, there should be more interdisciplinary work, or should that just be left to uh, personal taste, say? I think there should be more interdisciplinary work, but it's not just a matter of you know mixing and matching chocolate and peanut butter disciplines and hoping that it tastes good you know some disciplines have something to offer each other and some don't and some people within different disciplines would be profited by engagement with others and some would not uh, the typical physicist who is going about their day writing calculations or collecting data has zero use for a philosopher okay and likewise most philosophers have zero use for physicists they're trying you know when you you can't derive ought from is. So when you want to think about what ought is, the standard model of particle physics is of no help to you. But there are, as a matter of fact, questions of overlapping interest. So uh, Jeanette Ismail, my colleague here at Johns Hopkins, she and I have started up what we call the Natural Philosophy Forum at Johns Hopkins, where we are trying to bring together scientists and philosophers, so not just physicists, but chemists, biologists, mathematicians, computer scientists, uh, cognitive scientists who have interests that do overlap in philosophy. And what I think is that the organization of academia into, you know, you have humanities and then you have sciences, right? And there are barriers to stepping outside of that zone. When If you've ever sat in on a hiring committee meeting for a physics faculty, you know how incredibly clearly the lines are drawn between this is what we consider physics and this is not. And what that means is you can do really, really good work, but it's not quite inside the corral, then you're not going to be considered for a job in that particular place. And certain kinds of work, you're not going to be considered for a job anywhere, even though it's really, really good. If you're a senior person who's already famous and made huge contributions, then you can leap dis disciplinary boundaries very readily. But if you're a young person who is still fighting just to get a job, to get grant money, to get students and so forth, it makes your life much, much harder if you don't fit comfortably into a single discipline. So what we're trying to do is to make a safe space for people who are physicists, computer scientists, like I said, economists, whatever, who do care about the philosophical foundations of their work and for the philosophers who really want to make sure that they're engaging with the best of modern science when they construct their philosophical positions. I think this is an underserved area right now. So it's not just cool and interdisciplinary. It is in particular a place where there's lots of progress that is potential, potentially waiting to be made in the near term. And so we're hoping to make it easier to make some of that progress. Oh, that's that's great. That's great to hear. Uh, anyways, okay, uh, let's let's finally get to our main topic of uh, discussion today, which is that of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, you're one of the most, I guess, visible champions of the theory. You've given lots of talks about it. You've written a book about it, uh, something deeply hidden. And I'm I'm personally excited to uh, talk about the subject with you. Uh, 
speaking for myself, you know, I've taken quantum mechanics and quantum field theory in my studies, but the foundations of quantum mechanics isn't really something that ever comes up in a traditional physicist education, right? right? I mean, I don't, I don't yeah. know of how I would have ever come across many worlds in my own uh, professional life. That's something you kind of have to find on your own, so to speak. And uh, yeah, I'm curious actually how you got interested in it before we dive in and, and yeah, well, maybe just give an outline of your, your thoughts and, and how you uh, got interested. I have to I have to be careful because I could tell a half hour long story here. Oh, okay, um, sure, okay. But you know, I I learned quantum mechanics the completely conventional way, solving the Schrodinger equation, uh, solving differential equations with boundary values and special functions and all those things. No, no special questions arose in my mind about the foundations, etc. Um, I was also interested in philosophy even as an undergraduate, but not foundations of physics. I didn't know that was part of philosophy. No one told me that, right? My education was pretty scattershot in many ways. Um, so it, I didn't directly become interested in many worlds for a long time. I was interested in cosmology and the Big Bang. And when you are a theoretical cosmologist with any interest in quantum mechanics, it is overwhelmingly likely that you will be uh, sympathetic to many worlds. Almost everyone is, you know, Stephen Hawking, Stephen Weinberg, all of these, all of these people. Um, Jim Hartle and, and so forth. So, and and because it was, you know, this is an amusing little anecdote, but when Hugh Everett, who was the one who invented many worlds in its current form in the 1950s as a graduate student, why did he invent it? Well, John Wheeler, who was a famous physicist who was his advisor, gave him the thesis dis dissertation topic, quantize gravity. <laughs> in the 1950s, we didn't realize that was hard. So, and he didn't make any progress on quantizing gravity. But what he realized, Everett, was that the standard formulation of quantum mechanics back then, the Copenhagen interpretation, assumed that you could separate the observer from the quantum system. And you treated the observer as classical, and you treated the system as quantum mechanical. And Everett realized that if your quantum system was the whole universe, you couldn't do that. <laughs> so you needed a way to do quantum mechanics that didn't rely on a separation into observer and system. And that's how he ended up inventing many worlds. And even though that story is not very well known to working physicists, the sort of the same thing happens in the mind of people who care about quantum mechanics and cosmology. So all of those people, including myself, tend to be Everettians. But it wasn't until... I don't know what year it was, but more like 2010 or something like that, uh, that I actually started working on um, Everettian quantum mechanics at a research level. That's because Charles Siebens, who at the time was a graduate student, spent the summer at Caltech, where I was, and we thought we were going to work together on the arrow of time. He was a philosophy graduate student. Uh, but we ended up working together on quantum mechanics, and he started. He, he came and he explained to me why Everett couldn't be right. And we sat down and really started thinking about his objections, and we ended up arguing that Everett could very well be right after all. So uh, that's how I got into it, and that's how I started realizing that there were a lot of potential ways to make progress in physics if you took this point of view seriously. Okay, uh, great. Well, th thanks for that uh, that uh, background. Um, why don't we just dive in and start maybe going to the whiteboard? Uh, I thought I'd just start writing a uh, outline, and uh, we'll see. Uh, uh, how that goes, but uh, yeah, let's let's go ahead and get started. So I guess maybe the first thing we can do is, uh, well, let's review the uh, the well the measurement problem, right? That that's that's sort of like the central problem in in foundations of quantum mechanics. How do we understand measurement? And the the sort of the default paradigm, the one that's taught in textbooks, is the Copenhagen interpretation. And I guess we should sort of uh, review that and maybe state some of the problems with it. And then uh, after that uh, review, we can uh, dive right into the many worlds interpretation. And here, uh, I guess that's where we'll spend most of our time uh, talking and we'll go both into the technical and philosophical aspects because I think uh, there's a lot of, well, uh, rich philosophical things to consider, and we'll see how how far down that rabbit hole we'll go. Um, maybe if there's time, we'll see. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about uh, Bohmian mechanics and how that relates to many worlds. Is you uh, you wrote about it in your book, 
Um, and I just maybe, well, thought maybe that'd be a chance to explore more deeply. And then I know you mentioned maybe we, uh, if we have time, we could also talk about emergent space time. And I gather that's maybe uh, something that's worth talking because I think in all these discussions, it's sort of like personal taste, which interpretation you like. But I gather with many worlds, if you can kind of get something else out of it, then there's a stronger case for it, right? And I guess the emergent space time is one of those things. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right. Okay, great. All right, so why don't we uh, go ahead and uh, I'll, I'll let you be in the driver's seat now. I think you're right. I think it, it makes sense to start by, you can call it the Copenhagen interpretation, but I like, I like to call it the textbook interpretation of quantum mechanics because nobody agrees on what the quantum, uh, about what the Copenhagen interpretation is, okay? You start saying that and it's like free will and you just get into definitional arguments and it becomes pretty boring. But there is something we teach people in textbooks when we teach them quantum mechanics. And so I think that's worth uh, uh, letting people know about. So let's call it textbook QM. And it comes that the, you, you are taught rules and the rules come in two parts. And you're going to tell me how technical I can be. How technical can I be? <laughs> as, te as technical as you want, Sean. We've, we've talked about category theory and the standard model on my podcast. So you, as technical as you okay. want. <laughs> so there is a rule that says that quantum states in quantum mechanics are wave functions, you know, psi of x, but really that's not right. I mean, psi of x is a complex valued function of x, but that's for a particular case where you have a particle with position x, like maybe you don't have a particle, maybe you have a quantum field or space time or something more complicated. So really what you have is a vector and you write it with this funny notation invented by Paul Dirac. And so this is the state vector. That's an element of Hilbert space. And that's just a fancy way of saying uh, the vector space of all the quantum states. Okay, nothing, nothing different about that. There's an inner product and things like that. And you can be specific about it, but it's just the space of quantum states. And there's an equation, which is the Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation tells you how states evolve in time. And it says that there's an operator, the Hamiltonian H, that operates on the states. And that gives you I square root of minus one times the derivative with respect to time of the state. Maybe just one uh, interjection here. So I guess uh, when people, uh, I say, uh, what you first wrote here, right, this psi of X, when people first learn about quantum mechanics, uh, they've had training in classical mechanics and they think of psi of X as say, um, uh, having to do with say the probability density of finding where a particle is. Uh, but in general, it's more helpful to think about this abstract Hilbert space where you didn't write psi of X because say in things like quantum computing, you're just interested in sort of, uh, there the Hilbert space has a different interpretation. You're thinking about qubits. So, so the most general form of thinking about uh, quantum mechanics is this Hilbert space. And that's why we can just write psi without say psi of X. Anyways, I just thought I'd make that comment. Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's actually, it's a lot of things to be said about what psi is and whether it's real and things like that. But honestly, the only thing, even if the listeners here are not very technically inclined, but nevertheless are still listening, the only thing I'm trying to get across with these two rules are there are states and there's an equation that say how the states evolve. Okay, that's that's, right. that's what we have so far. And what is crucially important here is that this is exactly parallel to classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, we have states, we have positions and velocities, and we have some equations that tell us how they evolve, okay? Whether it's Newton's laws or Hamilton's equations, there's different equivalent ways of doing it. And so the first parts of quantum mechanics don't look any different than good old classical mechanics. And we wouldn't be taken aback by this. Like, this isn't weird to us. This is what we know how to do it. Like, you know, when we went from particles to waves, that was, you know, we need to adjust our idea of what a state was, what equations we actually used, but the basic paradigm of there are states and they evolve with time remained intact, okay? So quantum mechanics starts this way, but then it adds more rules. And all of the new rules that do not have any parallel in classical mechanics, have to do with the outcomes of measurements. So when you uh, make a measurement, different people have different versions of these rules. So you know, you forgive me if they don't line up with your favorite version, but it's the same basic thing. Um, 
when you make a measurement, you don't see the wave function. You can't just measure the wave function. You can't just measure the quantum state. Again, this is 100% different than any classical theory. In classical theory, you never use the word measurement. There's just the states because implicitly you can measure whatever you want about the states. That is not true, okay? In quantum mechanics, there are certain observables, certain measurable quantities. So upon measurement, Wave functions collapse. And it collapses onto some particular measurement outcome. So if you measure the position of a particle, you describe the particle before the measurement with this wave function psi of x. But when you observe the position, you see x. You don't see psi of x. You see that it has a position. And what is the relationship between psi of x and x? That is given by the Born rule, which says that the probability of measuring x is psi of x squared, or there is a more general form for the more general kinds of Hilbert space, et cetera. But the point is that you're not predicting the outcome deterministically. You're only predicting the probability of getting different outcomes. So you talk about psi of x, the quantum wave function. That's the shape of the electron orbital. If you're a chemist, that's the wave function, okay? It has some physical tangibility, apparently. But when you measure it, you don't see it. You see a position, a particle, they're in a position, and you can't predict exactly what position you're going to see it in. You can only predict the probability of getting it. So right. these new rules on the right-hand side here they have no analog in classical mechanics, and they deal specifically with measurements. And that's basically what we teach our students and, and we tell them mm -hmm. in textbooks. Maybe let me just supplement what you wrote here with uh, uh, one uh, maybe point of clarification. Um, uh, when you wrote psi collapses to outcome, uh, let me just contrast that with this Bohr rule that you wrote, which was more in this sort of uh, continuous setting. So um, what, also typically happens is that your wave function psi is really say a superposition of different uh, outcomes. I'll just call them I. So I is just this space of all outcomes. I'm writing this as now a discrete superposition. And uh, when you uh, do this measurement, then it collapses onto one of, you know, some particular I, I'll call it I prime. So this is the collapse, right? And then the probability that you will collapse onto this I prime state, uh, in this case, I'm running a little, running out of space here, but this P of X will be uh, C of I prime, or sorry, P of I prime will be C of I prime squared, that coefficient squared. So that's that's sort of a discrete analog of what you just wrote there. What you wrote there was, I guess, yeah. uh, maybe p uh, position space, let's say, whereas what I wrote down below was sort of a more general uh, setting. Yeah, that's right. And that will actually, this, this fact, it's a good fact that you're bringing up because it will come in later in the following way. All physicists learn classical mechanics before they learn quantum mechanics, okay? Including in history, we developed classical mechanics before we developed quantum mechanics. And therefore, there is a way that we have of constructing quantum mechanical theories, which is we start with a classical theory and then we quantize it. The word quantize is a verb. It makes it sound as if there's some rigorous algorithmic procedure, but there's not. There's sort of a set of rules and they're a little vague sometimes, but the hope is that if you have a classical theory, you can figure out a or several quantum mechanical theories that, that correspond to it in some way. But nature doesn't do that. Nature doesn't start with a classical theory and quantize it. So when you start with a particle that has a position X. There's a classical description of that. It moves around, Newton's laws. And then you say, oh, now I'm gonna quantize it and I have psi of X and I'm gonna observe it and I see what X is. That language makes you think that there is something called the position of the particle. I mean, you put it there in your equations and you measured it. It makes, you know, why would I deny there's something called the position of the particle? Well, the answer is until you measured it, there was no such thing as the position of the particle. Mm -hmm. There was only the wave function, okay? And more generally, you can have quantum mechanical theories that have no classical precursor at all. 
So that's why it's useful to have this more general setup when you don't sort of presume some classical reality that you're then quantizing. Just talk about quantum mechanical theories for their own sake and see what happens. I think there are two big looming obvious problems here. One is, I didn't tell you what a measurement was. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and nobody ever tells you what a measurement is. It's not defined. That's the measurement problem. The measurement problem is, on the one hand, the word measurement appears in the rules of quantum mechanics, unlike every other physical theory we've ever invented. That's bizarre. And number two, we don't tell you what it is. <laughs> There's no rigorous definition of it. Like on the left-hand side, there were math symbols, there was Hilbert space, there was uh, derivatives and the square root of minus one. On the right-hand side, there's just the word measurement. And then, you know, that feeds into some other symbols and things like that. But it's an ill-defined part of the theory. Like no one in their right mind could think that this was the correct final theory of the fundamental nature of reality. Not because it's wrong, just because it's kind of fuzzy and ill-defined and the correct theory of reality shouldn't be like that, right? Actually, just I don't mean it's probabilistic. It's perfectly okay for the theory to be indeterministic. You know, Einstein famously said, God does not play dice with the universe, but he was a very quotable guy, Einstein. And that really wasn't his fundamental problem. He could have lived with the indeterminacy. What he couldn't live with was the fuzziness, uh, the fact that the, the theory was just not well-defined. Mm. So that's the measurement problem. And if you Should, say, I, just clarify, I, I really uh, did, just, sorry? Yeah, just to clear, clear to the clarification. So I think when you said the measurement isn't well-defined, I think, I think correct me if I'm wrong, I think what you're saying is that somehow, I mean, on the one hand, mathematically, it's well-defined in the sense that it's, it's a projection operator. But I think what you're alluding to is that um, in terms of making this correspondence between what this mathematical artifice is of a projection with kind of um, maybe, I don't know what the right word is, but philosophical way of delineating measurement from everything else. Um, and also the way measurement is typically formulated is that there's a separation between the quantum part of the system and the classical apparatus. I think that's what you're critiquing as the ill-definedness of the measurement, right? Because from a mathematical perspective, it's just a projection, but I think you're, you're pointing to something other, something else that's problematic. What happens when you do a measurement is perfectly mathematically defined. What a measurement is, is not. Mm -hmm, what mm -hmm. counts as a measurement? Like, mm. does, does a video camera count mm. as a measurement? Right, does right. the air in the room count as a measurement? What if I don't have good eyesight? You know, I look at something. Does that count as a measurement? And when I'm looking literally with my eyeballs at all of the different atoms in the table in front of me, do they all have wave functions collapsing? That's what is not well defined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, the fact that we treat the measurement or the observer classically, that is kind of a spin-off problem of the fact that the whole measurement process is ill-defined. Um, people try to make it better defined, but... At the end of the day, it's like pornography. You know it when you see it. You don't have a definition for it. And the problem with that is we're increasingly, because of increasingly sophisticated uh, experiments and theories, we're moving into a regime where we don't know it, where we see it anymore. There are these edge cases we need a better theory for. Mm. Okay, great. That was, that was worth clarifying. Um, okay, so where, where do we go from here? Then the other, that's, I like to actually highlight two problems. One is the measurement problem, but the other one is the reality problem, okay? I think, and I know that in certain circles, this is considered charmingly naive, but I think that the job of science is to describe the real world. And that there's actually two statements hidden in there. One is, I think there is a real world. <laughs> and number two, I think it is science's job to describe it, okay? Uh, so... It is not clear from these rules of quantum mechanics whether there is a real world and if so, what it is. It is clear that we need to talk about wave functions to get the right predictions out of quantum mechanics. But is that wave function supposed to actually represent reality? Or is it just a tool? Is it just a black box we use to make predictions? And it's only the experimental outcomes that really represent reality. Yeah. So. Both of these are worrisome in some sense. Although it's, what you just what you just said there actually isn't unique to quantum mechanics per se, right? I mean, there's like is is a field a, a real object or is it just a mathematical artifice? Or, I mean, you could kind of say that about almost any any or I don't know about any, but many many things in theoretical physics. Uh, right? I think you can't. Fields are real objects. I think most of these questions are very easy. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Well, I, okay. I, I, uh, 
Okay, I, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but you know, the whole, uh, you know, uh, Newton with, uh, was, you know, uh, action at a distance and okay, now you say there's a field and uh, you know, you can, uh, what, sure, what level but, of granularity you, you want in terms of what's real and what's not, but uh, okay. Good, no, but, but to be a little bit more clear about this, it's a different kind of problem. You, you can absolutely have ambiguities in classical physics, for example, about how you describe reality. In the Hamiltonian formulation of classical mechanics, you have phase space, you have positions, you have momenta, and then you have differential equations that help you evolve the system through time. In the Lagrangian formulation of classical mechanics, you don't talk about momenta, you talk about the action, and it's an integral over trajectories, and you minimize the action, and your vocabulary for describing what happens is completely different. So you are allowed, if, if it makes you happy, to argue about which is real and which is not, okay? But they're equivalent. They're absolutely mathematically equivalent ways of describing the same thing. So the underlying physical substrate is real, and we know what that is. In quantum mechanics, we don't agree on what the underlying physical stuff is. We don't agree on any description of it. I mean, some people think that they have the right answer, but they don't agree with other people who think they have the right answer. So that's the reality problem. It's, it is a different level of problem in quantum mechanics than in classical. Got it. I, I see. Okay. That, that makes sense. So for example, uh, psi of x, like I said, it could be the whole world, or it could just be a way of, of predicting uh, experimental outcomes. And there are respectable physicists who believe either one of those. You know, This is a legitimate disagreement. This is why, as I said, when we talk about the natural philosophy forum, there's a lot of good problems out there that need this kind of interdisciplinary engagement. Here you go. When you talk about the nature of reality, here's a, a that's a philosophy question. But here is an example where it's staring you in the face in a physics context. And although this has been implicit in what we've been saying, but I'll say it out loud, physicists have been ignoring this question for many decades now. In the 1920s, it was taken very, very seriously. And Einstein and Schrodinger, who were against the conventional Copenhagen interpretation, they wanted to hold up uh, that problem. They wanted to emphasize it hadn't been solved yet, but the whole field moved against them. And decided, nope, nope, I'm not listening, la, 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 everything is solved, put it in the textbooks and let's move on. And that's been the story uh, since the mid-1930s. Okay, I, um, let's see. This I think this might be a good transition to many worlds because, as, as I think we discussed previously, one of the issues with measurement and the ontology of, of all this setup is what what is the nature of of measurement and, and observation. And, and, and in the textbook formulation, they're treated very asymmetrically without a very clear distinction between the two. And in many worlds, somehow, um, you know, one of the reasons you're a proponent of many worlds is it's very uh, parsimonious in that sense. It's just it's just the wave function and then everything is subsumed by that. Maybe, right. that so the, maybe we should go? Yeah. The good news here is that I can tell you what the many worlds interpretation says without starting a new slide. <laughs> so here is many worlds, and I'm doing it in red. And the entirety of the many worlds interpretation consists of crossing this out. So Everett says you should have stopped after you had written down the two sensible rules of quantum mechanics, the ones that say that there are states in Hilbert space and they evolve during the Schrodinger equation. He says, what if you just take that seriously? And that means, among other things, including observers as part of the wave function, right? As part of the quantum description of reality and not having any particular specialness to measurement or observation at all. Surely in terms of the well-posedness and rigor of the underlying rules, that's a better formulation of quantum mechanics. The question is, does it fit the data? Does it actually explain what you observe? So, I mean, let me say it in words, and then you can tell me whether or not we should draw pictures or draw equations for it. Um, the thing about quantum mechanics and the, and the wave function is you have this superposition of many possible measurement outcomes at the same time. So when you say psi of x, what you're really saying is that x1, x2, x3, all the different possible x's have a probability of being observed, psi of that x squared. And until you make that measurement, they don't yet quite become real. There's a hidden feature of quantum mechanics that is not obvious from what we wrote here, which is that different quantum systems do not have separate wave functions. 
there is only one wave function, only one quantum state for the entirety of all the systems that you want to think about at the same time. Everett's original name for his theory was the theory of the universal wave function. And this feature of quantum mechanics comes directly from Einstein. It was Einstein in 1935 in the famous EPR paper, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen, who said you know, the following thing. So imagine I have a particle, like, I don't know, here's a pion, a neutral pion. How about that? Making us look like we know some particle physics. So uh, the neutral pion is unstable. It's going to decay. It doesn't last forever. And it can decay into different things. But for example, it can decay into two photons, for example. Okay. But if the pion is just sitting there, it's not doing anything, then it, it's in its rest frame, right? There's no preferred direction of space or anything like that. So when it decays, you can use the Schrodinger equation and you can predict what it will decay into. And what you see is it's two photons that it decays into, and both of them are sort of moving out in a cloud. So there's some kind of photon one cloud. Photons are called gamma for historical reasons. Mm -hmm. And then there's another cloud. I'll give it a different color. Here's photon two. Okay, gamma two. The point is the prediction is each particle has a wave function that is moving out in a spherical pattern away from the pion. But as we said, you never observe these big spherical wave functions. You observe particles to have a position. So you predict a probability of seeing photon one coming out at a certain angle, photon two coming out at a certain angle, et cetera. And both of the photons could come out at absolutely any angle. So you don't know what you're gonna see. But imagine that you do measure photon one. So here's photon one going out in some direction and you've measured it, you've looked at it and you see it, there it is. Mm -hmm. Momentum is conserved. Right. So now you instantly know, even though you haven't measured it, what is the direction in which photon two would be seen to be moving? It's moving in the opposite direction because the total momentum has to be conserved. And you started with zero total momentum. OK, so you see it right there. The question is, the question from Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen is, how does it know? <laughs> how does photon two know what direction? to be moving in, okay? And the answer is that you don't have a wave function for, you might think you have a wave function psi one of photon one and a wave function psi two of photon two, and they're just separate, completely separate independent things. But that's not right, that was wrong. You have a single wave function of both the position of x1 and the position of x2, and they are correlated with each other. So that if you see photon one going in any one direction, you know that photon two is going in the other direction, okay? And what worried Einstein about this is that you could do that detection light years away. So this, it seemed like the two photons are communicating to each other faster than light. And Einstein, who had invented relativity, he was personally insulted by the idea that the photons are communicating faster than light. So he worried about locality and realism. He was trying to argue that in quantum mechanics, you cannot both have a local theory with no spooky action at a distance and have a realistic theory where there's really things going on in the physical world. And that was his work. Yeah. So this is actually, yeah, yeah. just maybe just to clarify a bit, because I remember watching your a uh, bit of your. Um biggest ideas where you talk about this uh, setup, I think there you were trying to um, draw an analogy between long range correlations, where in the typical EPR setup, uh, it has to do with uh, measuring spins, or at least for, for the setup in, in say Bell's paper, uh, studying the Bell inequality. I think what you were trying to do was to say, actually, you can see long range correlations, even in classical mechanics, because uh, due to conservation of momentum, you know that if you have these two particles going outwards, then merely by conservation of momentum, if you know the momentum of one, you know the momentum of the other. You're completely correct. I'm just trying to cut corners a little bit here just to get to the fun part of, okay. of many worlds. But uh, you're you're absolutely correct. If, if there were some fact of the matter, and look, Einstein knew this too. This was his point. This is why the paper was actually hard. And by the way, in the EPR paper, 
they didn't use spins. They weren't thinking of that way. They used this. This is literally oh, sort of the, the setup that they used. Bell Bell improved it later by talking about spins. It is clear if you talk about spins. But anyway, the point is, uh, sure, in classical mechanics, you could say, well, the two photons move in opposite directions. We don't know what direction they move in, but there is some direction they move in and they're opposite, okay? And that shouldn't bother you at all. The new ingredient in quantum mechanics is you could choose to measure either the position or the momentum mm. of these outgoing particles. And the same fact would be true about the position and the momentum, right? If you knew the position of one, you would know the position of the other. If you knew the momentum of one, you would know the momentum of the other. But quantum mechanics says you can't have simultaneously definite facts about the position and the momentum. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So you can't rely on this classical idea that both the position and the momentum were fixed ahead of time, and we just didn't know what they were. Mm. And that's, there's a whole separate argument for the uncertainty principle, but you have to sort of take my word for it right now. Right, but right. That's the basic yeah, I, idea. That's you, right. You're, you're raising a good point. Yeah. So it, 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 here it has to, it, you know, if we go back to this sort of uh, ill-definedness of the measurement problem, if, if the collapsing mechanism were some kind of physical mechanism, say, then this would truly be, I guess, paradoxical if we believe in locality, because somehow the collapsing of one wave function causes the I don't know what, what the right verb is, but causes the collapse of yeah, the other one. And that that's, the and right that's problematic. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So whatever it does is he takes all this big bushel of lemons and he makes lemonade and he says, look, I'm going to observe something. Let's make it simple. Let's, let's go with a spin. Okay. There's a spin, spin up or spin down, spinning clockwise or spinning counterclockwise, according to some axis that you picked out. And you know, the thing about spin, the reason why it's so useful to use, even if you're not familiar with it, is there's only two outcomes. So you know, there's for position and momentum, there's an infinite number of continuum of outcomes. Spin is either plus or minus. Those are the only two outcomes. It's literally a bit. This is where we get quantum bits or qubits from, okay? It's a true discreteness there. And so let's imagine that. We have a spin. It's in a superposition of up, spin up, and spin down. And we're going to measure it. And Everett says, you know, going along with what we had on the previous uh, slide, we are a quantum mechanical system. When you say we're going to measure the spin, all you really mean is that there are some laws of physics that tell you how the observer and the apparatus, et cetera, interacts with the spin. We're going to plug those laws of physics into the Schrodinger equation, into what's called the Hamiltonian here, which is doing all the work. And we're going to evolve the equation forward in time. So before you do the measurement, you have a spin, which is in a superposition. I'm going to ignore like numerical factors and everything. So sure. the spin is either spin up or spin down. Although it's actually, sorry, I shouldn't have said it's either one of those. It is in a superposition of both. Okay. And there's an observer who we say is in the ready state, which means just as a fancy way of saying the observer is in whatever state they're in and they haven't yet measured, they haven't yet interacted with the spin, okay? Now, in practice, in the real world, when we do the measurement, like I said, we either only ever see it spin up or spin down with some probability. Everett says, well, look, if the spin were 100% up, if there were no part of the spin's wave function that was down, then we would want it to be the case that the observer sees it spin up, right? That's what would be a good measurement. If we knew the wave function of the spin were 100% down, we would want it to be the case that the observer sees it spin down. And the Schrodinger equation, for those mathy people in the audience, is linear. The wave function only appears once, order one, on both sides. Now, linear equations are the easiest things in the world. You don't even need to solve them, right? You kind of know what the answer's got to be. If when I observe a spin that is 100% up, I see spin up. And when I observe a spin that is 100% down, I see spin down. When I observe a superposition, then I must go into a superposition of the system is spin up and the observer saw it up, plus the system is spin down and the observer saw it looking down. This is the prediction of the Schrodinger equation. So the point is, this is not the controversial part. Everyone agrees on what the Schrodinger equation predicts. It predicts that 
the state that you get by evolving the initial wave function via the Schrodinger equation is an entangled superposition of the spin was up and the observer saw it up, plus the spin was down and the observer saw it down. Everyone agrees on that, okay? But now is when we depart ways, because most people will look at this and they will say, that can't be right. Because I'm an observer, I've observed spins before, I've never felt like I was in a superposition of spin up and spin down, right? Or uh, having seen spin up and having seen spin down. Whenever I've actually looked at spins in the world, I always ever see them spin up or spin down. It's unambiguous and definite. I get an outcome. I can't predict what one it will be ahead of time, but I get an outcome. <laughs> Maybe let, let's just pause here and introduce some terminology for uh, j just... Uh, just because I think it'll be good. So we had this before and then after. So the process that led from the before to the after, right? That's called decoherence. No, it's not. Sorry, right? it's not. It's no. not? Not uh, yet, no. Not yet. Oh, sorry. That's why I wrote Schrodinger. This is just evolution according to the Schrodinger equation. Wait, I thought decoherence was precisely when you went from this product state to a non-product state. Or I'll tell you what Schrodinger decoherence is. is. Ah, Okay. To talk about decoherence, we need to admit that we cheated when we wrote this down. Because I already told you there's only one wave function for the whole universe. Mm -hmm. And what I wrote down was a wave function of a spin and an observer. So clearly okay. that's wrong because I ignored the entire rest of the universe. Okay. So I'm going to call the rest of the universe the environment. I'll put it in what we call the, the some initial state for the environment. And the environment includes like all the air molecules in this room, all the photons in the world, like everything that I'm not keeping track of, okay? <laughs> and then what happens is if I have an, a real physical apparatus, whether it's a person or a machine or anything like that, and I do this to it, the environment is going to interact with that macroscopic thing differently depending on whether that macroscopic measurement or observer says or sees or indicates, I saw the spin up or I saw the spin down, right? Like if I literally have a dial on a background that then moves and points to spin up, then the photons in the room are hitting the dial in one way. Whereas if it moved the other way to spin down, different photons are hitting it, okay? So the environment also becomes entangled with the spin and with the observer. So we have an environment state that is measuring the spin up in the environment and measuring the spin down in the environment. So how are you um, distinguishing between the observer and the environment in, in this setup? Whatever way I want to, it doesn't really matter. You see that they have been exactly parallel in their evolution. So. <laughs> I, the point is that I carve up the world into system, observer, and environment. Mm, okay. And I think, yeah, I think, right. So in, in, in Everett's uh, original PhD thesis, I don't think he ever uses the environment variable, which I think he only has kind of uh, system and observer, which is why I sort of maybe jumped the gun a bit when I said uh, that was decoherence. Right, but Everett didn't know about decoherence. The oh, okay. It had well, not been invented until 1970. I see. Okay. I, I was being anachronistic, of course, but okay. Yeah. Um, um, okay. So, but so by the way, that was why Everett was kind of a genius because he kind of saw that it would work, but he didn't really have the right explanation for why it would work. So just to very quickly jump ahead and then we can go back mm -hmm. and fill in. Sure. Everett's suggestion is that the reason why you don't feel like you are in a superposition is because you are not both parts of this quantum state. This is a world with a certain observer in it. And this is another world, he says. This is an interpretive move, which you can talk about philosophically or whatever. But the point is that there's not a you that is in a superposition of observing spin up and spin down. There's a version of you that saw spin up and a version of you that saw spin down. And the extra relevance of decoherence is these two parts of the quantum state are orthogonal to each other. So the inner product of the environment spin up with the environment spin down is zero to a very, very, very good approximation. And that's what guarantees that these two parts of the wave function will never interfere or interact with each other ever again. 
Oh, uh, I see. They're orthogonal to each other in Hilbert space. And so Everett sort of made some very fancy arguments that you are allowed to treat these two different parts of the wave function as separate worlds. Post decoherence, now that we know about decoherence, we can actually just show that you should treat them as separate worlds. I guess if, you, if I had just lumped observer and environment as one vector, is there anything to be gained by the, I, I still don't see the gain I get from splitting uh, uh, into two separate vectors there, the O and the E subscript. I think I, I sort of read Everett as sort of implicitly doing that. Uh, so there's only sort of two tensor products um, instead of three. I'm just wondering, do you, do you gain anything by having three instead of two? At, at this you do. Level? It's a practical gain. It's a physicist, mm -hmm. you know, bless your heart, Tim, but you're more of a mathematician. Okay. So, you know, you're just <laughs> okay. looking at vectors and, you know, they're orthogonal and it's all good. But the point is you could imagine talking, taking what we're calling the observer and mm -hmm. boiling it down to, you know, a single qubit all by itself, right? Just a, a qubit in which you have registered whether the original spin is up or down, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if that's all you had, you could undo the measurement. If all you had was a two-state system and a two-state observer, or maybe a three-state observer because there's a ready state, that's a sufficiently small number of degrees of freedom that you can control all of them and you can reverse the process. Whereas the environment has more than Avogadro's number of photons in it. And so it is impossible to undo the measurement in exactly the same way it's impossible to unscramble an egg or to unmix cream from coffee. It's not because it's literally in principle impossible. It's because it's never going to happen because of the large numbers and the low entropy you started with and the high entropy you ended up with. So mm -hmm. there's a physical feature of the environment, namely that it is sort of big and uncontrollable. That's what leads to the irreversibility of this process. I see. Okay, so I guess the, the uh, however you write it, the point is that you should think of this uh, e vector as having an overwhelmingly more number of degrees of freedom than, than the rest. And, and that's, yes. that's what, okay. That's, that's the distinction. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, but, uh, let's see, maybe, maybe, uh, back to the original point I was going to make, whether you call it decoherence or not. The point was that, um, uh, we initially had basically what's called a product state. And so you had basically, uh, a system tensored with everything else. And the point is that, um, uh, with what what has to happen is that with this Schrodinger evolution, now you get this entangled state where you have it's no longer a product state, and that's sort of part of the basic vocabulary of Everett, which is that there there isn't a well defined state of a subsystem because a subsystem assumes that you can just say here is my uh, whatever system, and then there's everything else. But that's that that is a fiction in this case because now that there are correlations, you can't just say what the subsystem is doing, it's doing something in relation to what everything else is doing. And so you can't sort of decouple everything. And then once you sort of start thinking in those terms, then that's how sort of the world uh, or emerges from that, because you have sort of different worlds corresponding to these sort of different uh, couplings between the subsystem and, and the environment. Yeah, no, that's right. So um, just to put it the, the same point in slightly different terms, we, we raised the two problems of the measurement problem, what is a measurement really? And the reality problem, what is reality really? And so Everett is a completely 100% unambiguous about both of these. Reality is represented by a vector in Hilbert space. That's what reality is. And measurement is just when a quantum system that's in a superposition becomes entangled with its environment. And as you said, in general, uh, you're not going to be able to assign individual quantum states to subsystems of the wave function of the universe. Sometimes you will, sometimes you get lucky, uh, but in general, things are going to be entangled with other things. And so that is actually a feature rather than a bug. That is saying that there are ways to find structure in the vector that we call the vector of the quantum state in Hilbert space that we attach to, you know, different parts of the world, different subsystems, and also different branches of the wave function. Mm. Where, where do we go from here? <laughs> well, so um, let's, this is so good. It's obviously true. And I know that you already, already believe it, everyone in the audience, but nevertheless, 
there are people who doubt it. So we could bring up a couple of the objections. So, yeah, well, actually, let's 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 one can define measurement in terms of these trace operations, right? And I don't know, it might be useful to kind of maybe take a look at that just to see how when you have a mixture state, mixture state like you have here, that sort of the uh, the way that the, the partial trace works, you, right? So you take a partial trace over the environment, you get this uh, um, uh, uh, new uh, state um, of the subsystem that's not a pure state. And then if you sort of right. look at the way that math works, you can kind of see many worlds in that it's basically becomes a classical ensemble of different worlds. And I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you think that's like a worthwhile calculation to kind of look at just to see how this because there's lots of notions of of um probability and superposition floating around and i and and that kind of notion of many worlds is quite distinct from the kind of superposition of probabilities that involves complex amplitudes in the quantum mechanical world right so i don't know do you think that's maybe worth illustrating so let, let me say some words first and then we can redecide. you know i i know exactly what you're talking about i don't usually speak that language because this is uh, to me, the difference between physicists and philosophers. Um, there's many different ways to draw that distinction, but one way is physicists are absolutely dedicated to getting the right answer. And you think that's a pretty good thing. I'm in favor of getting the right answer. You know, like physicists are, are, are smart about that, but they're so dedicated to it that they're very happy to get the right answer for the wrong reason. Whereas philosophers are so dedicated to reasoning and logic, they're a little bit less dedicated to getting the right answer. <laughs> so, you know, they end up being antinatalists or whatever and thinking that all human beings should die, but with a really rigorous argument that follows logically from the premises. So uh, that the argument about density matrices, I'll give you a version of it, but a simple version of it, but it's a, uh, it gets you the right answer but I don't think it's for the right reasons. Mm. I think it's it's skipping over the important physical content there. So let me explain. Let me explain what I mean. I'm just going to once again add a little bit uh, to what we've already written. So what I'm going to add is um, some coefficients. We're going to say that there is a complex number alpha in front of spin up and beta in front of spin down. And then those numbers just go along for the ride, right? And this mm -hmm. is what in conventional quantum mechanics would give us the probability. What we want to say is that the probability of seeing experimentally the spin up is alpha squared. So we say P up is alpha squared and P down is beta squared. And of course, alpha squared plus beta squared equals one. So you'd better have picked that from the start. And so what you can do, you know, the, the calculation that you're alluding to in terms of tracing out the environment and the observer and looking at the reduced density operator for the system shows that if you do get rid of your knowledge of the outside world, you know that the system is entangled with the outside world, but let's forget that. Let's think about what we know about the system all by itself. What we find is that it's, there's a matrix that describes the state of the system, and the matrix has the properties that its diagonal elements are non-negative numbers that add up to one. <laughs> and the great thing about non-negative numbers that add up to one is that they obey the axioms of probability. So they look like probabilities of things. So if you're lazy, you say, therefore, they are probabilities of things. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's what they are. I'm going to interpret them as probabilities of things. I think that's very much cheating to, to do that. Um, there's an When you talk about, so there's, there's the famous problem or puzzle for Everettian quantum mechanics, which is deriving the Born rule, okay? Right. Because if you go back to our original list of axioms of quantum mechanics, the, the Copenhagen approach and many other approaches postulate a probability rule. They postulate as part of the structure of the theory that the measurement outcomes have a probability of coming true given by the wave function squared. 
That's nowhere to be found in the Everettian rules. The Everettian rules just say there are states and they obey the Schrodinger equation. So it is beholden on the Everettian, speaking once again about people's responsibilities, Everettians have an extra task the Copenhagenists don't have. They have to derive the Born rule. Okay. Right. right. And, and you do but, that in, in your book, and, and Everett also attempts to do that in his, his paper as well. Right. Everett's way of doing it, classic case of getting the right answer for the wrong reasons. He absolutely cheated. Everyone agrees. And we, we sort of don't talk about that anymore. Because, again, there's an easy the, – the, the task of deriving the Born rule has an easy part and a hard part. The easy part is – why is it the wave function squared rather than the wave function cubed or the logarithm of the wave function or something like that? That's an easy one. The answer is because that's what gives you things that obey the rules of probability. <laughs> the <laughs> coefficients squared very naturally are non-negative numbers that add up to one. That's just what they are. So that you didn't need to work. You can work as hard as you want, but that's there. That's built in. It's kind of obvious. It's ultimately okay. Pythagoras' right. theorem. To sure. Be yeah. And, and you want to... Uh, from a mathematician's point of view, you want to preserve the, you want to use the Hilbert space structure. And that's what you get. I mean, you could do to the fourth as well and get positive numbers, but it wouldn't work as well with, you know, having unitary operators and preserving. No, but the, the, like the norm would not be preserved under Schrodinger evolution if you chose. The uh, norm. Exactly. But that's, that's what I meant. Yeah, the, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah, you want not only numbers that add up to one, but that keep adding up to one over time. Exactly. Right? That's, yeah. that's what I meant. Good. Yep. Mm -hmm. So so, but so that's the easy part. The hard part is why, what are those numbers the probability of? In the Copenhagen interpretation, we really had the wave function collapsing in a way that was not compatible with the Schrodinger equation. It was a different kind of evolution. And there was a, is a very frequentist way of thinking about things. If you did it a billion times, you would get frequencies that obey the Born rule statistics. But the actual evolution is truly and deeply stochastic. In Everett, there is nothing stochastic about the evolution. It is perfectly deterministic. You can't say in Everett, I think there is an alpha squared probability that I will be the person who sees the spin up. What you can say with 100% probability is that there will be a future descendant of me that sees spin up, and there will be a future descendant of me that sees spin down. This evolution here from before to after, there is no collapse. There's just one part of no the wave collapse. function They're that, both that has this, right, the alpha component and the beta component, and, and that's, uh, that's what you get. That's right. And if you think about it, or you look at that equation, you stare at it, alpha and beta are just going along for the ride. They don't even affect the evolution. I didn't even tell you what they were, right? But yet I'm supposed to interpret alpha squared as the probability that experimentally I'm going to see spin up and beta squared is the probability experimentally I'm going to see spin down. I agree that they obey the axioms of probability, but what are they probabilities of? That's mm -hmm. the, the respectable question. Yeah. And I can tell you the answer. I know what the answer is. Oh, sure. <laughs> okay, tell, I sure. Think, tell I me. I do think Everett is right. What really happens in this evolution is that the environment, the decoherence process, the environment becoming entangled with the system is much, much faster than the human eye can see. <laughs> it's faster than the human brain can contemplate, okay? It's, it's faster than the observer can realistically become aware of what is happening. So there's an intermediate step. This is the decoherent step. It's still, evolving according to the Schrodinger equation, but it basically sends us to alpha, spin is up. Observer is still in the ready state. Observer hasn't changed yet, but the environment has become entangled with spin up. And likewise for spin down, beta, spin is down, observer is ready, environment is entangled, okay? Mm. This is just a, a physical reality that we have to learn to deal with. And so in that state of affairs, there are, according to Everett's rules, there are now two observers because decoherence has happened and the branch, the wave function is branched into two different possibilities. But those two observers have identical quantum states. Mm -hmm. In particular, they each one of those observers is on a branch but they don't know which branch they're on. Mm. 
So this is what we call self-locating uncertainty. You know the entire wave function of the universe, and yet you don't know where you are. <laughs> There's something you don't know, but it is what philosophers call indexical uncertainty. It is uncertainty about your location in some regime, okay? And so what do you do when you have indexical or self-locating uncertainty? You try your best to be a good Bayesian, and you have some priors. So you have some probabilities, some credences, that once you do look at the spin and see what it's doing, you'll see spin up or you'll see spin down, okay? And so how do you assign those credences? And there's an argument, it's too long to get into right here, but there is an argument that there's a uniquely rational thing to do in this situation. And guess what? It's to assign credence alpha squared to being on the branch where the spin is up and credence beta squared to being on the spin down branch. It once once you get that far, once you get to explaining what what the what the self-locating uncertainty principle tells you is where the probabilities come in. Even though the evolution is deterministic, there is a place in the evolution where you need credences for something. Mm. And once and you have that, the math just tells you what the credences are going to be. Okay. Uh, yeah. Looking at your book, I think there were two arguments. I don't know if they're related or not, but one was this idea that, and it sounds very reasonable, which is that in the special case where say alpha and beta have the same norm, then you should assign equal credences to them. And right. then there was some other thing that you alluded to, but didn't go into your book was about if you kind of thought about it from sort of economical terms in terms of utility and maximizing utility and what a rational agent would do, you'd also get the same answer. I, I'm, I'm guessing the latter one is more contentious because you know economics is, is a contentious field, but uh, <laughs> right. But but the 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 one where you know sort of you should have uniform priors if you have uniform coefficients that seems very reasonable, and I think I could see how that would lead to this because if you accept that, then um, in the limit where you how to say suppose you have alpha and beta unequal, how do you get the alpha squared weight and beta squared weight? You can. Uh, this is a very sketchy argument, but and it was sort of sketched out in your book, which is that if you kind of uh, continue, if you think about refining this experiment where you continue splitting over and over so that things get subdivided and subdivided, assuming you could orchestrate it, you could sort of uh, uh, have like a, a, basically a refinement such that all coefficients are equal. And then if you sort of work your way backwards, you'll see that everything uh, had to have um, arranged themselves such that al you assigned it alpha squared uh, to one guy and beta squared to the other guy, just by sort of, if everything were an equal mesh, so to speak, they'd all get uh, equal contributions, and then the number of components that contribute to alpha squared is exactly you know the the, the number of of elements, right? I don't know if I made any sense, but I I could see why. No, that's sort you of you got it exactly yeah. right. That is exactly right, and uh, and and like I said, you know, spiritually, there's no other answer you could get, but <laughs> that is one way of justifying the answer. The uh, the decision theory argument actually came first. It started with David mm. Deutsch. And it was quite a clever little argument. Um, it was basically like, imagine that when you had different measurement outcomes, they made you happy or sad. So you assigned value to getting different measurement outcomes. And he said he didn't care whether they made you happy or sad. But once you decide whether they will make you happy or sad, and you think that there is a probability of being happy or sad, et cetera, if you want to maximize your utility, he was able to show that you should act as if the probabilities are given by the Born rule. And David Wallace um, later came in and, and cleaned up the argument and made extra uh, strengthen it, ways to strengthen it and so forth. So this argument that I just gave you here is different. But again, there's many different ways to get the right answer that, that we know what the right answer is. Uh, the role of self-locating uncertainty was emphasized by Lev Weidman, an Israeli physicist. And then um, uh, Wojciech Zurek, uh, who has a different approach and is not even really many worlds person. You know, he showed how if you do have these equal amplitudes, equal imply equal probabilities, then you can get the whole Born rule. And so Chip Stevens and I um, combined these ideas together to really show how self-locating uncertainty gets you the Born rule in exactly the way you want. Mm. Maybe, maybe actually one thing that uh, I overlooked when I first looked at um, Everett's paper. You know, you you mentioned uh, it, which is that uh, Everett didn't do the right thing in terms of deriving the Born rule. And having looked at the literature since then, I believe it's because everything he was doing was basis dependent, right? And I think that to me, that actually isn't maybe uh, one of the potential overall objections to the many worlds in the sense that um, 
let's take a step back for a second, right? So we, we've, we've written everything cleanly in terms of system, observer, environment. And uh, it's not at all clear to me, at least, how you make these nice distinctions between uh, these things. And if you're going to st uh, start doing uh, computing Born rule probabilities with respect to this decomposition, then from a mathematical perspective, you run into the issue of that, that decomposition will affect your uh, Born rule, I believe. I believe that's the criticism with Everett's approach, right? So, so I know, anyways, what, what, why don't you respond to that? Yeah, I think, I think the criticism that I have in mind is a different one. I mean, th there are criticisms along those lines, um, and, and they're very important questions to think about. The, the criticism I have in mind is that the, whatever it does and what subsequent generations did, uh, Jim Hartle and Fari, uh, Goldstone and Gutman are, are examples that I have in mind. Um, what they said was the following. Let's imagine you kind of are a frequentist. Let's imagine you want to do experiments an infinite number of times, okay? And you take the limit. And then you look at the measure on the space of trajectories, okay? So there will be some branches where you got spin up every time, some branches where you get spin up with a certain frequency and spin down with a certain frequency. And they argue that if you have exactly the state that we have in front of us, uh, that you're doing repeated measurements on, uh, in the limit of an infinite number of measurements, the only, the, the set of branches that have the Born rule statistics, in other words, alpha squared uh, spin ups and beta squared spin downs have measure one. And the whole set of worlds that don't have Born rule statistics have measure zero. And they say, therefore, it is overwhelmingly likely that you will eventually see Born rule statistics. The problem is they're cheating because they're sneaking in a, a identification of a measure with a probability. If we could do that, we would have just set it equal to the Born rule to start. Yeah, I'm a little conf confused because it sounds like uh, you're invoking some kind of uh, law of large numbers, which already assumes a measure. Maybe that's what you're what you're right. basically saying. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it already I mean, smells fishy. No, yeah. but again, there is a measure. It's the Born rule measure. That's the measure on the you know that's that's the the metric. There's an inner product on Hilbert space. The question is, when do you get to interpret it as a probability? <laughs> right. And so they they sneaked it in for only things of measure zero, but that's still sneaking it in. Okay, that's still making a, a leap there, and I don't want to make that leap. That's that's my uh, most well known criticism of Everett's kind of approach. I see. Now, what about this thing I mentioned in terms of uh, sort of the split dependence between system and observer and things depending on on that? Right. Do you have any thoughts so on that? That's. That is very interesting to me, and it is philosophically uh, very rich terrain to mine, I think. I think that we we basically see the outline of the answer to that, but there are lots of details remaining to be uh, worked out. Because look, I can just, I can forget about all these spins and whatever, like we said, and say, look, I have a vector. I, I call it psi. And it moves around according to this linear equation. So it's not even a very interesting equation. It just sort of goes around in circles. That's all it ever does, okay? I, I don't see planets and stars and people and puppies anywhere in there. I don't see space. You know, I don't see fields. I just see a big vector. Well, wait, what are you talking about? Like, where does all this reality, the structure of the world come from? And more sort of clearly, more definitely, more, more concretely, um, we did two kinds of decomposition, right? We said first, we could do a tensor product decomposition of Hilbert space into subsystems, spin, observer, environment. And then we can do a direct sum decomposition into branches, right? Like this branch, that branch, uh, they're orthogonal to each other in their environment states and all that stuff. Who says that those are the right decompositions to do? So in the, in the case of the branches, this is what is called the pointer state problem. So it's, it's cl most clear when you think about Schrodinger's cat, okay? You know, Schrodinger had a way of amplifying a, a two-state quantum superposition to a macroscopic object like a cat. And he, he made the cat be in a superposition of alive or dead. As a cat person, I do the same thing, but with a sleep and awake. I just do sleeping gas instead of uh, killing the cat with cyanide. So a cat can be, let's say that Schrodinger is right, the cat can be in a superposition of awake and asleep. 
And the point is, the thing that Schrodinger was trying to say was not like, isn't quantum mechanics awesome? He was trying to say, surely you don't believe this. <laughs> he was skeptical of it. This is, you know, he actually uh, said he was kind of regretful he ever had anything to do with the Schrodinger equation once he knew it was going to be used to calculate probabilities of things. So he says, if I'm to take this Copenhagen story at face value, when I open the box, the state of the cat changes from superposition of awake and asleep to one or the other instantly. I never see the superposition. I only ever see one or the other. And that just sounded wrong to him. But the more sophisticated question is, why is it that when you open the box, the only states you ever see are an awake cat or an asleep cat? Why don't you ever see one over the square root of two awake plus asleep or one over the square root of two awake minus asleep? Those are perfectly good quantum states, right? And there's an answer to that. This is the pointer basis question. Why is it that there's a certain very predictable set of quantum states that are always what we observe in macroscopic systems. And the answer is, if we observed a, cis, a cat in a superposition of two macroscopically different things, we would instantly decohere because these macroscopically different states of the cat would constantly be interacting with their environment. And furthermore, once you have a definite macroscopic state, once the cat is either awake or asleep, not in a superposition of both, then it doesn't keep decohering. Then all the photons just hit the cat and they either get absorbed or they reflect off or whatever. It doesn't matter. They don't treat different parts of the cat's wave function differently. They don't become entangled with the cat. So there is a physical reason why certain states are preferred. They are the states that are robust under being monitored by the environment that do not keep getting more and more entangled. So actually, uh, so I'm not too familiar with the physical processes that you just described. Can you, can you repeat again the distinction about uh, how we know which macroscopic systems have or have not decohered or, or when, they, when that will happen? Yes, I will draw a picture. Sure. Okay, great. So we're in a superposition of, here is uh, a cat. I am not a good artist, but here's a cat. This cat is awake, okay? And then... This cat is asleep. Okay. All right. And we have some photons coming along. That's the environment. The environment is everything around us, right? And the point is that here's a photon that comes along. In the part of the wave function where the cat is awake, this photon gets absorbed when it hits the cat. In the part of the wave function where the cat is asleep, the photon just keeps going by. So the photons interact differently with the cat in the part of the wave function where it's awake and the part where it's asleep. And it says nothing to do with cats or awake or asleep or alive or dead. It's just when you have a macroscopic system in a, in a superposition of two different positions in space, the environment becomes entangled with it. When I say the photon interacts differently with the awake cat and the asleep cat, what I mean is the quantum state of the environment becomes entangled with the cat state, okay? Mm -hmm. But then once that happens, once I no longer have the asleep cat, once I, let's say I'm, I'm, I've branched, okay? And now I'm in the branch where the cat was awake, right? Now I can have more photons and they can interact with the cat but they all interact with the cat in exactly the same way. They either bounce off or get absorbed or whatever. So they don't entangle with the cat. Entanglement is not the same as interaction. Entanglement is where different parts of the wave function of one system interact differently with different parts of the wave function of the other system. If the whole wave function interacts in the same way, that's not entanglement. That's just interaction. So a pointer state is a state that the environment can monitor all the time without becoming entangled with it. Mm -hmm. And so the, those are the states we physically see in the world. That's why physical objects in the macroscopic world look like they have definite positions in space. I see. Although maybe now this is getting, uh, this might get quite philosophical now because uh, uh, how to say, you, you just made a claim that uh, certain types of states, the uh, the, the ones that are not uh, entangled uh, with the environment, say, 
are the ones we observe. That sounds like some kind of statement about, you know, consciousness or, or something of that matter. I don't know. Um, and that also, I guess, also takes us into, uh, I guess, one of the, let's, let's call it naive objections to the many worlds, which is why don't I perceive the branching? Uh, how do I make sense of my identity in this uh, branching world? So maybe can you address those those issues? Uh, yeah, so? they absolutely are philosophical questions. So David Wallace, who I mentioned earlier, uh, likes to say that the reaction of philosophers to the measurement problem of quantum mechanics is to say, clearly, we need better physics, whereas the reaction of physicists is clearly we need better philosophy. <laughs> and that that roughly maps on to people who like Bohmian mechanics or spontaneous collapse models where they literally want to change the physical underpinnings. The Everettian say, look, the physics is fine. We just need to understand what it implies better. And so th these are absolutely good questions to raise. And the way that I would put it is, it has nothing to do with consciousness. What it does have to do with is emergence. It has to do with the fact that there are patterns within this wave function or this quantum state that are kind of self-sustaining and self-describable without knowing all the details. In exactly the same way the table in front of me is an emergent pattern, right? I know that really it's made of atoms and molecules, but I don't need to know all the atoms and molecules to describe what the table is doing. Um, this microphone in front of me is also an emergent pattern, and we all agree that it makes sense to talk about the microphone as something separate from the table for various reasons. If I push the microphone, the table doesn't move or vice versa, right? You know, they, they are part of a description of the world that has causal efficacy in a way that doesn't require me to know all the details about what is going on. And it turns out that the Everettian branching is exactly the same way. The reason why branches are well-defined the way they are, you don't have to do it. If you were Laplace's demon, if you knew exactly the state of the universe perfectly, you would never need to talk about branches or anything like that. But you wouldn't need to talk about tables and microphones either because you just know exactly the position of every atom, right? It is there exists a way of talking about the universe that is very causally efficacious that requires much less detail than the full description would. That is an emergent description. And this is why Wallace's book is called The Emergent Multiverse <laughs> and why there's philosophy to be done here. Like what exactly are the conditions under which emergence happens? When is it okay? Are we cheating? We worry that we know the answer we want to get and therefore we're getting it, right? So we're trying to be as careful as we can not to get the right answer for the wrong reasons. Actually, let me let me clarify something you just said, because I don't think I understand. So you said uh, we don't have to talk about branching necessarily if we knew everything, although I, I think of the example you just described as being different in terms of tables and, and, and chairs there. Uh, it, it, you know, it makes sense that tables and chairs are emergent concepts because we could, I guess, describe everything in terms of their individual atoms, whereas in the branching situation, that is an actual phenomenon. Uh, that happens in the wave equation. It's it's not so much about whether we decide to just just use that description. Or not. It actually happens, right? So I'm, I'm a little I'm a little confused about your how, how you relate those those two. The only thing that ever happens is that the wave function evolves according to the Schrodinger equation. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. In a certain basis, mm -hmm. it looks like the wave function branches. Right. Mm -hmm. Why is that the right basis to think about? It's the same kind of reason as why is it sensible to think of a microphone as an object and a table as an object. Oh, I see. I see. I see. What's emergent is that exactly that splitting between these macroscopic objects. Right. Okay. And actually, yeah, I, I was trying to think a little bit about this too in, ter in terms of um, the way many worlds is described because we, we, we like to describe it poetically in terms of, okay, there's a branch where, say, I think this is from your book, like where you order pizza or order Chinese food. And that's, a, of course, a very macroscopic splitting. Now, uh, let's back up a bit. Um, so, so we talk about quantum mechanics. It, it takes its most, uh, it's it's most visible in the in the microscopic world where h bar is 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 large and and, and uncertainty effects actually happen. In the macroscopic world, um, it's a different story. And we like to say it's because you know h bar is so small, and so you don't have to worry about quantum mechanics when we you know measuring baseballs and things like that. Um, so, so my question is. Um, 
how do we go from the splitting of individual uh, electrons in terms of their spin, which is microscopic, to talking about the splitting of macroscopic things, because sort of a wrong inference would be, just to use an analogy, would be to say, okay, well, uh, the position of an electron is uncertain. And so since I'm, you know, an Avogadro's number worth of electrons, then the uncertainty of, uh, of where I am should also be an Avogadro's number times h bar. And so I should be also very uncertain. That's not what we see. It's somehow, there is a distinction between the macroscopic and microscopic and the sort of the microscopic uncertainties don't aggregate. Um, and so I'm wondering also in this sort of, if we were to take that analogy to the many worlds case, there is uncertainty about individual spins and I'm made up of a lot of electrons. It's not clear to me that you can go from that microscopic branching to say, oh, me as a whole person and all my decisions are going to branch. Um, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you think about that sort of emergent macroscopic branching versus microscopic branching? Well, again, the idea of Everett is there is only one wave function for the whole universe. Everything really is fundamentally quantum mechanical. Um, when we talk about the uncertainty on the position of an electron, and remember, from this perspective, there's no such thing as the position of the electron. The uncertainty is just a way that we have of talking about how localized the wave function is. And so it turns out, just to, to answer part of your question, Macroscopic objects, if I talk about my center of mass coordinate and I plug it into the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, remember the uncertainty principle relates the uncertainty in position to the uncertainty in momentum. And momentum, and that's a constant, right? And momentum is mass times velocity. So usually, since velocity is how I think about things moving, I talk about the uncertainty of position times the uncertainty of velocity goes as one over the mass. So heavy objects not only don't increase their uncertainty, they generally have smaller uncertainties mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. small objects in things mm -hmm. like their center of mass frame. But that only tells you the minimum uncertainty. It doesn't tell you why physical objects are localized at all. And to do that, you need to understand branching. It really is about branching. It's a question of when does branching happen? And the answer is when macroscopic objects start to have their wave functions spread out a little bit, they're going to branch because they're going to interact differently with the environment around them. There is a famous example uh, that Zurich, who I already mentioned, uh, wrote a, a fun article about in Physics Today. Um, there is a moon of Saturn called Hyperion, like many moons of Saturn, it's just like a captured asteroid, right? It, who knows how long it's been there. It's a tiny little thing. It's lumpy. It looks like a potato, okay? And the reason why it's interesting is because it is sufficiently lumpy that you can show that the way that it tumbles is chaotic, i.e. if you only know its position a little bit and there's some uncertainty in your knowledge of its position, uh, your ability to predict its position a short time later is very, very small. It will have tumbled in some unpredictable way. It's kind of like a double pendulum, but it's a, it's a tumbling potato instead. So much so, Zurek points out, that even if you knew, even if you had localized the wave function of Hyperion as much as you could, within a few tumble cycles, it would spread out all over the place. And when you looked at it, you wouldn't see a potato. You'd see a spread out fuzzy spherical blob. But of course you don't. Why don't you? It's because it's being it's interacting with sunlight and the cosmic microwave background and all these other parts of the environment that are decohering it. So decoherence really is, well, let, let's put it this way. The environment really does monitor us and keep us in line. If our wave functions begin to spread out a little bit, we branch, and rather than actually having a wave function spread out over different positions, we have different branches with a localized version of ourselves on each branch. Hmm. Um, okay, maybe I, I don't know if this is related to the things we talk about, but just just another thing as I sort of try to internalize this sort of self branching, I I, I think one thing that's hard to come to grips with is you know um, it, it's related to the fact that. Um, we are composed of many microscopic things and therefore we are not well-defined things. It's sort of like the Cerides paradox. When is a pile of sand, when does it cease to become a pile of sand as you remove one grain at a time? And likewise, 
you know, I, I could have, say, one electron on the tip of my thumb branch. I could have maybe a hundred of them, a thousand of them. At what point am I, whatever I means, branching? That's one, that's like sort of one, one question. Um, and the second is, um, back to this pizza and Chinese food analogy, sort of, uh, sort of the, the, the folk way of interpreting the, the many worlds interpretations that, oh, you know, all, all possibilities are, are, are possible and everything is sort of naively, is naively equally probable. I'm, I'm you know, coin flip, uh, buy pizza or buy Chinese food. Of course, there's an infinite variety of foods you could order. And there, there isn't, uh, you know, there is no uniform probability measure on, on an infinite space. Um, how do you think, yeah, how do you personally think about sort of some of these macroscopic puzzles, you know, what I just said in terms of the microscopic branching, aggregating to sort of macroscopic things, and then sort of how do you really assign weight to all these possibilities when you know they're not, you know, uniformly probable? Yeah, you know, I think that the answer to the first question about um, when do we qualify something as branching or something like that is approximately as interesting as the sand pile question. <laughs> you know, sure, we don't have a definite answer to when you st it stops being a sand pile when you remove grains of sand. Who cares? <laughs> when in the real world, the sand pile is big, we recognize it as sand pile. If there's only a couple of grains there, we don't. And that's the point. In the real world, branching can be very vivid and very clear. And if it's not, then we just don't care about it that much. It is not a rigorous concept. It is an emergent higher level approximate concept. And that's okay in exactly the same way that sand piles are okay. You can say the same thing about the table in front of me. If I remove an atom from it, is it still a table, right? Yes, but okay. If I kept going, it would run out. It doesn't matter what point it runs out at. The point is that when it is a big table, I can talk about it as a big table. For the decision-making process, you know, I, I do think, like I said, when we talk about free will, that we are, are physical systems, we obey the laws of physics, you know, free will is, or decision-making is not above and beyond the laws of physics. But what that means is that it's not that you make a decision and therefore bring a different world into existence. That's not however it works. It might be that a different world comes into existence and on one world, it looks like you made one decision and on the other world, it looks like you made the other decision but your decision-making is parasitic on the world, not the other way around. You're just obeying the laws of physics. There is an interesting physics question embedded in here, which is, are there a finite or an infinite number of worlds? That's a perfectly reasonable question. We don't know the answer. It is plausible either way. Uh, I tend to think there's a finite number, but if there's an infinite number, then you just do what you always do when you have smooth, continuous things in math. You do calculus. You don't talk about the number of worlds between X and X plus delta X. You talk about the measure of worlds between X and X plus delta X, and that's perfectly well-defined. Hmm. Okay, uh, uh, great. Um, okay, I've, I've asked a lot of questions now. I know at some point you said uh, we were going to talk about the objections to the many worlds. Are there any I haven't uh, ra raised yet that are still on the table? Well, I think that the one... We've talked about the good ones. <laughs> we okay. talked about the ones I worry about. The probability question is a good one. Mm. And the structure question is a good one. Uh, you know, how do we divide, from the mathematical point of view, how do we divide up Hilbert space into subsystems and branches and things like that? I think both of these are perfectly good questions that have primarily philosophical implications. Like, you don't need to understand a lot of new physics to answer them, I don't think. You just need to get your reasoning correct to get it right. But they're good questions. And I think that uh, especially the structure question, there's still a lot of room for improvement. Um, the probability question, I tend to think that it's just a stubbornness of some people to believe it or disbelieve it. Like people either just don't want to believe it or they're going to believe it no matter what. And it's hard to, for them to have a conversation with each other. There are a lot of bad worries about Everett, and I would almost rather not bring them up because you know why, <laughs> why bother? But it, you know, the 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 worst version of the argument is you know it's not really a falsifiable theory because you're positing the existence of all these other worlds, which I can't visit. That's a really bad argument because I'm not postulating the existence of all these worlds that I can't visit. What I'm saying is there's a wave function. It's an element of Hilbert space. It obeys the Schrodinger equation. I repeat myself because people keep twisting it, but that is what I'm actually saying. The worlds come along for the ride. The worlds are there 
as long as you believe in Hilbert space, you believe in the possibility of all these worlds. And as long as you believe in the Schrodinger equation, you believe these worlds will become true. In, in other versions of quantum mechanics, you have to get rid of the world somehow. You have to collapse yeah. the wave function and get rid of them. Right. Because fortunately for us, we, we have the uh, slide in front of us where we can just see on slide four where the... Uh, Basically, if you just apply, uh, many worlds, it's just a consequence of decoherence. So maybe just to try to steel man that bad argument, could a person therefore just shift the buck over to say, oh, I'm not happy with, I don't know, let's say decoherence. Maybe, maybe they're, that's their objection. Do you, is there, do you have anything to, to, to say to that? I'm not sure what their happiness has anything to do with anything. <laughs> what you need to do is propose an alternative theory. And people have done that. People have proposed theories where the Schrodinger equation is not always right, where mm. the wave function literally does collapse, for example, right? And that would not follow the evolution we saw in this um, slide. And guess what? It's testable. <laughs> you can, mm. if you want to falsify Everett, Everett just says the wave function always obeys the Schrodinger equation. All you have to do is find an example of a wave function that is not decohered, not measured or anything like that, and it doesn't obey the Schrodinger equation. That's a very doable thing. People have been trying to do it. They have failed to do it, but if they did, Everett would be falsified. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, okay, any, any other... Uh... Bad or good objections? We uh, uh, that's I've given them enough objections. Okay. I don't want to, okay. I don't want to get into Great. Okay. We mentioned Bohm before. I don't know if you want to say anything about Bohmian mechanics because I think there was an interesting uh, there, there's an interesting analysis of it which I don't quite fully understand and maybe you can explain. Which is that, um, and I believe it's due to David Deutsch, which is that Bohmian mechanics is somehow many worlds in, in denial because it sort of prunes out all these other worlds. Uh, I, I don't know if that's maybe too deep, but I, I'm curious to know your, your thoughts about that. Yeah, you know, look, I'm personally not very pro Bohmian in any way. So you really should get a real Bohmian on. You know, some of them are, <laughs> are quite respectable people. I'm not the person to defend the theory. But the basic idea is that the motivation is the following. When you do something like the double slit experiment, so you send a wave function through two slits, and it mm -hmm. interferes. Interference is a fundamentally wave-like phenomenon, right? That's what interferes. Waves go up and down, they interfere with each other. Sure. But then when you measure the outcome on the screen at the on the other sides of the slits, you see a dot. It looks like a particle. That is a fundamentally particle-like phenomenon. You do not see the wave. So Bohm says, following Louis de Broglie, by the way, who said a very similar thing in the 1920s, that's because it's both. <laughs> there really is a particle and there really is a wave. And the way that we would say it in modern language is there really is the quantum wave function, Schrodinger's wave function, but there are also other variables. There are particle-like variables, okay? And uh, I'll tell you why I'm completely unimpressed by this, but then I will tell you a fun story because the story is more interesting than the, than the physics here. Um, the reason why I'm unimpressed is because the world is not made of particles. Quantum field theory is a much more, these days we know, accurate way of thinking about the world. And Bohmians still have no good consensus on how quantum field theory is supposed to fit into their framework. Bohmian mechanics works very well if you really were in the world of non-relativistic quantum mechanics circa the 1920s. Um, but it doesn't work well for quantum field theory, much less quantum gravity, et cetera. People have tried, and individual people will say, you know, they think that they know what's going on, but it's just a much less natural fit. Um, here's the story. So David Bohm was an interesting character. He was a graduate student in the 40s. He, by all rights, uh, he was a graduate student at Berkeley. His thesis advisor was Robert Oppenheimer. And by all rights, he should have worked on the Manhattan Project, but he was not allowed to work on the Manhattan Project because he was suspected of being a communist. <laughs> so when Oppenheimer went to the Institute for Advanced Study after the war, uh, Bohm was hired as an assistant professor in Princeton's physics department, and he was soon thereafter fired and locked out of his office by the president of Princeton because it was the McCarthy era, and he was, again, suspected of communism, and he was basically hounded out of the country. He couldn't get a job despite getting letters of recommendation from Oppenheimer and Einstein, and he ended up moving to Brazil, okay? Mm -hmm. that's, but that's not, the, that's not the story. The story is... For whatever reasons of his own, when he was an assistant professor at Princeton, he decided to write a textbook on quantum mechanics. And he wrote the book and he showed a draft to uh, Einstein. 
And Einstein, you know, in, in the book, you know, back in the 50s, you were still thinking, even though, like you said, when you take quantum mechanics, you never think about the foundations. In the early 50s, they were still thinking a little bit about the foundations, right? It hadn't completely been ironed out. So he included a discussion of hidden variables of what we would now call Bohmian kinds of theories. And in his book, Bohm says, these have been ruled out by a theorem proven by John von Neumann. And he cites von Neumann's book on quantum mechanics. The problem is von Neumann's book was in German. It had never been translated and Bohm didn't speak German. Very few American physicists at the time did speak German. But Einstein spoke German and Einstein said, yeah, I looked up this proof. It doesn't prove that at all. And Einstein was right. Einstein was very smart, actually. He was a very clever guy. He understood all this stuff, despite his reputation for you know not catching on to quantum mechanics. And so Einstein said, look, think about this more carefully. Like, if you don't like it, you don't like it, but say so for the right reasons. And so Bohm went away and thought about it. And he realized that you could have a hidden variable theory, which we now call Bohmian mechanics. OK, so he wrote it down. And the secret was that there is non-locality in it explicitly. So this is why Einstein, you know, as, as John Bell later said, the Bohmian mechanics solves the EPR puzzle in the way that Einstein would have liked least <laughs> by being explicitly non-local. No one cared. So Bohm wrote down his theory. Nobody cared except John Bell. Bell, for some reason, got interested in Bohmian mechanics, and he was kind of embarrassed. He didn't tell any of his friends at CERN where he was working at the time. But he thought about it a lot, and he thought about this non-locality. He, he was asking, he was wondering, you know, is this non-locality in Bohm's theory necessary, or can we get rid of it? Can we have a hidden variable theory that is local and uh, gets all the predictions of quantum mechanics? And of course, he proved that you couldn't. That's Bell's theorem. This is his famous result. Bell proved that the predictions of quantum mechanics are going to be different than the predictions of any purely local realistic theory with definite measurement outcomes, um, without thing crazy loopholes like super determinism or things like that. And so, of course, we all know Bell's theorem became a big deal. People tested it. The Nobel Prize was given last year for people who tested um, Bell's inequality. Bell thought that Bohmian mechanics was probably right. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that we should at least teach Bohmian mechanics in all of our textbooks. And when the Nobel Prize was given out, the press release said, John Bell proved mathematically the hidden variable theories are impossible. That is blatantly wrong. He was a fan of hidden variable theories. He proved that local hidden variable theories cannot... Uh, agree with the predictions of quantum mechanics. So even today, even at the levels of the Nobel Prize Committee, people still don't know enough about the foundations of quantum mm. mechanics to get these statements exactly right. Have they, have they modified their, their, their uh, whatever, I prize doubt description? It. Oh, no. I doubt okay. it. But, you know, <laughs> I complain. Tim Maudlin complained, but they're not going to listen to us. Oh, that's unfortunate. The original question was... Uh, Bohmian in many worlds to be... Uh... Oh, right. David Deutsch. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. So look... What Deutsch is, all Deutsch is saying, as I understand it, is the following. In Everettian quantum mechanics, reality includes, is just described by the wave function. That's the only variable. In Bohmian mechanics, there's two sets of variables, the wave function and these extra particle-like variables. And, and Deutsch says, look, as long as you have the wave function there, it's going to obey the Schrodinger equation. It does in Bohmian mechanics. The Schrodinger equation is unmodified. One of the reasons why Bohmian mechanics just looks wrong is because the wave function pushes around the particles, but the particles do not push around the wave function. It just seems weird. So Deutsch says, look, you're going to have decoherence. You're going to have branching. You're going to have all the worlds that are in Everett. It's just that the hidden variables are sort of pointing to one world as special, but the other ones are still there and people could live in them. So that's why he says that Bohmian mechanics is basically hidden variable or uh, Everettian quantum mechanics in denial. Hmm. Maybe just to 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 um, make this more explicit, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just just to make sure I understand what what that claim is making. I kind of drew the uh, the setup of the double slit experiment. But if we write out Bohm's equations, just at least the shape, we don't have to write it out exactly. But it's it's a it's going to be a partial differential equation, right? So where the um, mm -hmm. let's see where the uh, particles are going to be guided by some uh, we, I forget the exact. Uh, 
formula, but some function of the, the wave function. And it's going to be a function of these particles themselves. And I think the point is that in the classical double slit experiment, uh, when you think about things in terms of waves, there's of course going to be these uh, sort of interference patterns you're going to get. But if you had some hidden variable theories uh, with, the, um, with these particles with actual um, well-defined trajectories, then I think what the claim that's being made is that say the particle really goes through uh, this slit right here, then I think what uh, David Deutsch is basically saying is that even though the wave function uh, lives in uh, sort of both um, in, in the world in which it, uh, the particle goes the left or the right, since in fact the particle only goes through one of them, it's sort of like the wave function uh, still has, um, I guess, support on both slits, but since the Q isn't there, then it's sort of like you have these ghost wave functions, um, but only particles that sort of guide the wave function in, in one world. So that's, that's the sense in which there's all these potential worlds, but since Q only goes through one slit, then only one of these worlds is realized and it's extremely wasteful. I, I'm not sure if I'm saying that quite correctly, but that's my interpretation of basically what he's saying. Well, I think, and I, I'm not an expert on this because I don't think Bohmian mechanics is right, but okay. uh, it, it's not, I don't think it's a matter of being wasteful. I think it's a matter of the rest of the wave function is still there and is part of physical reality. So I could mm -hmm. call other branches of it worlds, whether or not the cues were there or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, okay, maybe let's, okay, so let's let's move on from Bohmian mechanics. And um, actually, I think this might also lead, lead into the emergent space time. But actually, since you brought up um, uh, the subject, I wanted to ask you again about how to think about many worlds, which was that... Um, We've only talked about quantum mechanics in the Hamiltonian formulation, but there's also a Lagrangian formulation. And that you don't really see that in a course in quantum mechanics. You really only see that in, say, quantum field theory when you start looking at uh, expectation values of operators and, and things of that nature. Um, does, how, does many worlds uh, look much different in that setting? Or are there any problems in, in that setting? I mean, of course, uh, you could, you still uh, will have a Hilbert space and you can. Um, kind of formally play the same game, but are there any difficulties, say? I don't think there are any difficulties. Um, the path integral or Lagrangian formulation of quantum mechanics is mathematically identical to the Hamiltonian or Schrodinger equation picture of it. It's just like the relationship between Hamiltonian mechanics and Lagrangian mechanics and classical mechanics. There's no difference in predictions or anything like that. There's just different words. So it might very well be inspirational or calculationally useful to think of in one terms or another, but there's no physical issue that arises uh, from one picture or another. It does, by the way, get us into where we're going for this final topic here of emergent space time, because I didn't quite get to address all of your worries about splitting up the wave function into subsystems. You know, we talked about splitting up into branches which Zurek and his friends, I think, mostly have under control. But the original splitting up into subsystems of system, observer, environment, that's a, a less well-studied question. And I think that um, there is the, the sort of kind of argument is the same. It's a, it's a parallel argument where, well, what do you want? You want an emergent system that you can describe using fewer variables, et cetera, et cetera. That kind of argument still gets you the right way to divide into systems and, and other systems, but it's trickier and people haven't looked at it as much. Ashmeet Singh and I wrote a paper on it uh, a couple of years ago that we called quantum muriology. Muriology is the relationship between holes and parts, okay? How do you divide up a hole into a part? And so the the framework, this is getting back to your to the Lagrangian stuff, the framework in which we worked was, like we, I've been talking here, uh, the Schrodinger equation, the Hamiltonian, et cetera. There is a way of thinking about many worlds that is sort of more in step with a path integral way of thinking, which is the uh, decoherent histories formalism, where rather than saying I have a division of the world into system and environment, and I look at decoherence and branching, I can have different ways of taking the evolution of the quantum state and coarse graining it 
into uh, different things that the wave function does at different points in time, right? Coarse graining is just taking a whole bunch of different possible microscopic behaviors and lumping them together. Like when we talk about the table, the table is a coarse grain version of all the atoms. And so it's more flexible. The, the decoherent histories formalism is a little bit more powerful, a little bit more flexible. I think for many, many purposes, it is too powerful. Like you don't need it. You can get by without it. And so people don't study it that much, but it's there. And it's sort of more in step with this space timey approach of looking at trajectories rather than just looking at states evolving from moment to moment in time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, actually, maybe just one, uh, maybe this is too much of an aside, but actually one one comment I wanted to make, which might be helpful to, to listeners, is that um, the path integral approach looks superficially like a many worlds uh, uh, formulation, but it's quite different from the many worlds of uh, that we've been talking about, because those are sort of virtual worlds in the sense of being a computational artifact, but they don't actually exist in any real sense. I just thought I'd maybe throw, throw that out there. I don't know how you yeah, think about so it. Yeah, the, so the way that I would put it is the following. Um, how many worlds are there is a question we've already asked, right? And I have this kind of minimalist approach where, I, and I've already said it implicitly, if if we don't have decoherence, we don't have separate worlds, right? Mathematically, I can always take a vector and decompose it into some of two different vectors. That doesn't mean that I can take a, a branch of the wave function and just decompose it into two different branches and call those two different worlds. If they're identical physical worlds, I don't want to do that, right? I want I want my physical worlds to be truly different. So when I have the double slit experiment, like you've drawn here, I don't say that there's a world in which the electron goes through one slit and a world in which it goes through the other because they can interfere later. They're in the same world. It's one electron going through both slits, interfering with each other. If they had been measured and decohered, they could not interfere anymore. So if I don't measure it, there's no different worlds in, in my language. But I think that people like David Deutsch speak differently. I think that he would mm. talk about a world in which the electron went through one slit or the other. So there is a little bit of arbitrariness there. The path integral formalism of quantum mechanics, which says, imagine every possible path where a particle or a field could take from some initial condition to some final condition. And like you said, that's a mathematical artifice. And I use it to calculate the probability that I really will observe something ending in a place if it started some other place. And they're not, no one is trying to attach reality to all of those paths in the path integral formulation. Not even David Deutsch would do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of unfortunate unfortunate they you kind of i should take a step back is there maybe this is like not even a proper question but is there a reason why uh i mean i actually how did Feynman even come up with that analogy of summing over all possible trajectories i mean th th that has nothing to do with the many worlds interpretation but nevertheless that was a useful concept to have i'm just curious if there's any historical relationship yeah. between yeah. the two or yeah you know i don't know what i know is sort of like an amusing sort of hand wavy argument that probably Feynman didn't use, but people use after the fact to justify it. They go, look, in classical mechanics, you can contemplate the space of all possible paths, right? And in fact, when you do the principle of least action, right. you do contemplate that space. And you say, of all these possible paths the particle could take, I pick out one of them as the physically real one, the one with the lowest value of the action. And you could say to yourself, isn't that a shame to be wasting all those other paths? <laughs> Isn't it like just wasteful to just have all those paths and not do anything with them? Mm. So to say that a function, in this case, the action, the action assigned to different paths, to say that the function is at a minimum is to say that it's slowly changing with respect to variations, right? So the thing about minimum action paths is that they are very close by in path space to paths that have almost the minimum action. So if you take all of those paths that are near to the classical path and you assign them a phase, right? Um, some complex number of, of unit modulus. So plus one, minus one, I, minus I, something in between, e to the I theta. As long as that phase is similar, they will all constructively, inter constructively interfere. So they will add up together. And for very different paths where the action is changing rapidly, 
then that phase that you assign will generally destructively interfere and cancel out if the phase itself is the action, because the phase is very, very different for very, very non-classical paths. So you might guess that from a wavy point of view, adding up E to the IS uh, is a way of using all the paths, but at the end mm -hmm. of the day, giving most of the weight to the ones near the minimum action. Yeah, I, I guess maybe in, in hindsight, uh, maybe the way one could try to retroactively justify this is that really in, in quantum mechanics, there's also an I in the, in the uh, E to the I S uh, unlike classical mechanics. And you could think of it, sum over all paths is really the, the superposition principle in the extreme, right? You're, you're, yeah. <laughs> maybe yeah that's something the way like that. I mean, yeah, I know yeah, that, yeah. I know that historically Dirac wrote down E to the I S for some purpose, but it was always vague what it was supposed to be. And Feynman literally asked him, like, what were you doing there? And he goes, yeah, I'm not sure. Dirac famously <laughs> was hard to talk to. He wasn't very loquacious. Mm. So it was Feynman who integrated over all the paths, the, the number e to the is. Mm. Mm. I, I okay. think, though, the way that he talked about it and, and, and derived it was not, was really just like, you know, like when you drive calculus for the first time and you you divide a curve into like many little small increments and uh, that's what he did. He said, starting with one moment in time and, and integrating forward mm. to another moment uh, with the ordinary Schrodinger equation that is like doing the following integral. I think that was yeah. his, his argument. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Anyways, I think that was a, that was an interesting uh, digression to, to clarify certain things. Quite correct. So how, how did the emergence space time come about? Yeah. I mean, look, the good news is we're almost there. We, we almost set everything mm -hmm. up already. But let me back up a second to, to emphasize why Everett matters here, because mm -hmm. most people don't care, most physicists, theoretical physicists even, don't really care about what formulation of quantum mechanics you want to use. They all give the same predictions, right? But as I said, different formulations might inspire or poke you in different directions. If you're a Bohmian or a hidden variables person, or if you're an objective collapse person where you say that wave functions collapse to certain locations under certain circumstances, the formulation of the theory in both cases requires a specification of what you mean by space-time. Wave functions collapse to certain locations in space-time. The variables have certain locations in space-time, okay? Everett doesn't have space-time there. It just is a wave function. It's just a vector in a really big Hilbert space. Now, you can write it, and John Wheeler did this. You can write psi, just like you write psi of x, you can write psi of the geometry of space-time. You can attach a quantum amplitude to every possible geometry that space-time can have, and you can go on from there to try to do quantum gravity, et cetera. But maybe that's cheating, right? I mean, that's picking a basis. You're using the geometry eigenbasis or something like that. If you're pure hardcore Everettian, all you have is a vector in some big vector space. And it's exactly the question we were already asking. How do you emerge structure from that abstract vector? And we talked about emerging branches. We talked about emerging subsystems, right? With decoherence and entanglement and things like that. Now we're asking, how do you emerge space? But it's the same kind of thing, you know? Uh, there's a brilliant paper by um, Kotler, Runnington, and... Uh, no, Kotler, Pennington, and Renard, uh, which said the following thing. Let, let's imagine I have a lattice, okay? So I have a set of points with spins on them or something like that, something very condensed matter physics-y, right? Like the Ising model, like little spins that are interacting with their nearest neighbors, okay? I, I think I know my favorite way of describing that Hilbert space. It's just the tensor product of every one of the Hilbert spaces for the individual spins. So I group them all together by multiplying them by each other. The question is, can you go backwards? Can you start from one giant vector and say, oh yeah, I should think about that as a lattice of spins, okay? Well, what do you have to work with? Like what 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 do you have to get a handle on? And the answer is the Hamiltonian. So now we're, we're very late. There's only the hardcore listeners still listening. So I'm going to be a little bit more technical and, oh, sure, and mathy, of course. if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, please. So you have the Schrodinger equation, which says H psi equals I D by DT psi. And psi is an element of some vector space, the Hilbert space. Okay. 
That's all you have. That's the entire theory. So in particular, I didn't say that psi is a wave function of anything, of space, of spins, of fields, or whatever. It's just a vector. It's just a, all vectors are created equal. It's just a very high dimensional version of a vector pointing in some direction. In other words, there's no preferred basis. There's no preferred representation for this vector, except there is one because we have this equation, the Schrodinger equation, and that has a Hamiltonian in it. So we can diagonalize the Hamiltonian. So we can find a basis in which the Hamiltonian looks diagonal. And in fact, that's just the energy eigenbasis. So that means that H n equals the energy for state n times n. These are eigenstates of that operator. And then the diagonal form of the Hamiltonian, its elements are just the energy eigenvalues. So E1, E2, E3, dot, 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 and then zeros. Okay? So when you say, and at least in the context of a finite dimensional Hilbert space, when you say, here I'm giving you a theory, a quantum mechanical model, what is the data? What is the information you have to give me? And the answer is, the energy eigenvalues. This is called the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. Just the list of energy eigenvalues. And that's it. So the idea here is that you should, the reverse engineering question that you're asking yourself is, can you start with nothing but this list of energy eigenvalues and say what that physically represents? <laughs> oh, yes, that's a two-dimensionalizing model, right? Or a three-dimensionalizing model, or it's it's the standard model of particle physics or whatever. So in particular, if it's finite dimensional, can I find a decomposition of Hilbert space? Here's Hilbert space. Can I write it as a big old tensor product over small Hilbert spaces where I have a lattice <laughs> with nearest neighbor, neighbor interactions? Oops, I don't know what I was thinking there. Okay, so you have an, a big lattice, small lattice, whatever. But each one of these little factors is an H alpha. Can you do that? Is there a way to decompose Hilbert space into something that looks like a graph that, that forms a nice two-dimensional lattice or whatever it is, a 20-dimensional lattice, whatever? And so Cotler, Pennington, and Renard proved, yes, they proved that for a generic spectrum, there is no way of writing the Hilbert space, decomposing it into a local form. When there is a local form, it is essentially unique. You can find it, you can reconstruct it just from the energy eigenvalue. Let, let me just say some, uh, like just how I'm thinking about this very naively. Um, uh, if you if you had this temper if you had this tensor decomposition that would uh, also imply some decomposition in terms of the eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So is it is it already obvious that you for a generic Hamiltonian you can't have the structure just because if you did have that structure then basically the eigenvalues of the composite system would be the you know the tensor products of the eigenvalues of the, the individual system. So so if you just give me a, a random list of numbers I'm just not going to have that decomposition. So that. Exactly. I mean, I the general rule yeah. of thumb here yeah. is that nothing here is generic. Everything here requires very, very special features for the Hamiltonian. Okay. Okay. So, but that's okay. Like the world has a very non-generic Hamiltonian. Sure. Right? Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why does it have a non-generic Hamiltonian? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. But it does. Okay. And so the only question we're asking here is if the Hamiltonian does secretly represent some local physics, some notion of space, can we find it from just the energy eigenvalues? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And their answer is yes. I see. You know, let me, let me just uh, t t t take a, a slightly different perspective because I think it's related. When I was looking into this, it, it uh, r reminds me of a, of a certain uh, viewpoint in mathematics, which algebraic geometers like to use, which is uh, understanding geometry from algebra. So what you can do is instead of a space, think of a, of a space as the fundamental thing and thinking of the functions on that space as being derived from it, you would start with an algebra of quote unquote functions. And then you could think of the points of the space as probing that algebra of functions. Because if you have an algebra of functions, a point gives you a function on that space, which is the, the evaluation at that point, 
right? Mm -hmm. So so that's how sort of uh, algebra can lead to geometry. And I th and, and that's sort of um, maybe an analogy of what's going on here. You have a, an algebra given by operators on a Hilbert space. And by looking at the spectrum, which is some algebraic data, you want to recover geometry. So I think they're, they're kind of analogous in that sense. Yeah, no, I think it is very true. Like this, this story that I'm telling you, and then just to, just to mention, we can do, we can go one step beyond this. And rather than just looking at Hilbert space, we can actually look at certain special states rather than just Hilbert space, specific mm -hmm. states, low energy states. And we can talk about the geometry of this emergent space. So mm. what Collar et al. did was tell us how to get emergent space. Mm. What my collaborators and I, Charles Tsao and Spiros Mikolakis, are able to do is put a geometry on that space using quantum entanglement. But what I was trying to get to was uh, the fact that all of this is brand shiny, new, and speculative and could be completely wrong. <laughs> But it, there also could be much better ways of doing it. You know, like this is analogous to what Einstein and Bohr were doing with uh, the photoelectric effect and the Bohr atom long before real formulations of quantum mechanics came along. This is very tentative, primitive stuff. And I'm sure that it, so either it's wrong or there are better ways to do it. Those are the two options. <laughs> and so I think there could be a lot of fun math in looking for better ways to do it. Mm. So, I'm sorry. So, how do um, how does this relate to many worlds? Good. Many worlds forces you to ask this question because in other formulations of quantum mechanics, you just put space time in by hand. Many worlds, all you have is a vector in Hilbert space, and you have to ask, how does space time emerge? Ah, okay. Um. Oh, I see. So you're you're trying to you're trying to make uh, many worlds even more parsimonious by not starting with the Hilbert space attached to some space. You're just saying if I really want to be a hardcore minimalist, start with the Schrodinger equation. Can I get space and time from it? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, by the way, space and time are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I'm letting time be fundamental. There it is in ah, the that's right. Schrodinger equation. Um, Maybe you shouldn't, okay, but look, one thing at a time. Right now, I'm letting time be fundamental. That's yeah. right. Yeah, I was looking into this. There's also, uh, related to this, versions in which time can also be emergent, yep. where now- That's right the now, whole thing. The whole chapter yeah. in something deeply hidden, so yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, right, where now you have the uh, analogous to uh, apparatuses and observers, you now have vectors corresponding to clocks, and they can get entangled right. and- Right, right, right. Okay. So the takeaway is that um, it seems to me that if you want to just um, have this Everettian philosophy, if all that is is the Hilbert space and the Schrodinger equation, you can push that to its limit because of this uh, research program of going from, say, the Hamiltonian to a space. Yeah, that's the, the goal is to, I mean, again, very primitive and we have a long way to go. The goal is to start with the spectrum of a Hamiltonian. At the end of the day, say, oh, look, it's three-dimensional space plus time with the standard model of particle physics plus general relativity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts on, let's see. Um, yeah, just this whole subject matter. I mean, it's very, it's very obviously provocative. Um, I guess they're actually... <laughs> what what okay i guess it's the field has evolved a bit what um in terms of many worlds being uh, more mainstream what how would you say in terms of uh the percentages of people that are in favor of many worlds of course that's maybe a misleading or not right way to measure things because as we just discussed the nobel prize committee <laughs> described the uh the virtues of the the bell experiment incorrectly so so yeah. ma majority a uh, uh, decision might not be the best metric, but what, what would you say is the uh, where where people lie on on, on this the statistically speaking? Yeah, it's it's an almost impossible question to answer. Um, most physicists don't care; they do not have a favorite interpretation right. of quantum mechanics, and they get along just fine. Um, the ones who do care, the favorite interpretations will vary wildly depending on their subdiscipline. So, particle physics. Gravity, cosmology people are strongly Everettian. People in quantum information theory are often epistemic. 
they just talk about the predictions and don't talk about reality. So they're instrumentalists in some way. Uh, people in philosophy of science tend to be either hidden variables or objective collapse people. All of these are very rough oversimplifications, but you can't just say, like, what do most people believe? Because you have to, right. it will depend a lot on how you draw your boundaries around most people. Ah, actually, interesting. In, in, in terms of the philosophers favoring hidden variables, is that so they're okay with, say, uh, giving up uh, locality? Yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, Tim Maudlin, who is one of the leaders here, will say, once Bell wrote down his theorem, we knew the world wasn't local. Why are you still fretting ah, about this? <laughs> ah, I see, I see. And ah. and by the way, what I would say, I have a, an idiosyncratic take on this. You know, I, I have all my takes, and all my takes are, of course, correct. But I try to at least distinguish between the ones that everyone else agrees with and, and those that are idiosyncratic. So is many worlds local or not? There are plenty of people, including David Wallace, for example, who will say that one of the virtues of many worlds is that it is local in a sense, right? Um, Bell's theorem says that you can, cannot have a local theory that is realistic, that is you know, not just instrumentalist, but realist, that reproduces quantum mechanics if it gives definite measurement outcomes. And many worlds says you don't get definite measurement outcomes. You get different measurement outcomes in different branches, okay? So that's the loophole. So Wallace will say you can just be local. What I would say is the whole worry is backwards. I think the starting point is a vector in Hilbert space. And when you say the word locality, you mean local in space. Like we just said, a generic Hamiltonian acting on a vector in Hilbert space doesn't even let you have a notion of locality, much less insist upon it. So to me, the question is not, well, Bell taught us that there is non-locality going on. How are we going to deal with it? To me, the question is, quantum mechanics teaches us that locality is just not fundamental. Why is it such a good approximation? That's mm. the question. Why does the world actually, look even a little bit local? Yeah, actually, I think there's one thing we uh, maybe uh, uh, overlooked in the setup, which is that there's quantum mechanics and there's special relativity. Those are a priori distinct uh, fields of study and in quantum field theory, we merged them, but we, first of all, didn't have to. And second of all, there are Hamiltonians that won't respect, uh, uh lo locality or causality. Right. So I think that, that that's what you're, 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 you're pointing at. Well, you know, there's locality and there's locality. Um, it depends on exactly what you mean. I was, I've been assuming special relativity all along cause it's, it's pretty good. Um, even Newtonian physics is local in a sense, in the sense that you can write down differential equations that are local in space, or you can write down an action, uh, and the action is an integral over space-time. It's not an integral over many different copies of space-time separately interacting with each other. So the, the role of locality in non-relativistic theories is much more difficult to get precise because there's no speed of light barrier, and if you do move the Earth, its gravitational field changes instantaneously through the universe. But still, it's obeying a local differential equation. So it depends on what you want to emphasize. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, great. Thank you so much for your time, Sean. This has been a very fascinating discussion. Uh, I hope um, this will enable people to get some technical substance behind many worlds because uh, I think my impression is that most of the discussions of many worlds is going to be at the level of kind of words and philosophy and maybe some technical discussion, but not, not to the level that uh, we have gone through. So, so yeah, I'm... I'm uh, I hope this will be uh, valuable for people to see. Yeah, I hope so. You know, um, you're absolutely right. Uh, whenever we talk about science at a general level, we always translate things into words. And the translations are always a little bit imprecise. And, you know, so just a little bit of equations can go a long way. And, and, and never it is definitely a situation where once you see the equations, once you get it, it doesn't mean that you're going to accept the theory, but you see why people might think this is an interesting way to go. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Sean.